Okay. Well, thank you for, for being here this evening. Um, and I'd like to welcome uh, Jill Tata, uh, who has uh, flown here, especially from California, uh, to, to give this uh, presentation at this uh, Ghost Scar workshop, looking at uh, the non-science impacts uh, of SKA, or the potential non-science impacts. Uh, Jill is, uh, has had a very long association with the SKA, um, but, uh, and I'll describe that very briefly in a moment, uh, but more importantly, of course, she is a very well-known uh, astronomer uh, and a great advocate for the, uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. She's the Bernard M. Oliver Professor uh, at, uh, at the SETI Institute, I believe. Um, I hope I have the, uh, the title right. Um, uh, but based, as I said, in, in, in California, um, she spent much of her career trying to answer the question, uh, are we alone? Uh, and in fact, spent a significant fraction uh, of well, several years uh, working uh, both with Jodrell Bank, with Arecibo, and with other telescopes, uh, with SETI designed equipment based at the telescopes, uh, searching for those elusive signals. Um, I know you're um, into your retirement, well, partial retirement now, Joe. Uh, and I know you're still, still searching, as, as we, all, we all are. We, we hope, uh, I think, that SKA will be a tool that, uh, that can help in this search. Um, I'm counting on it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I mentioned Jill's long association with, with the SKA. Uh, she was actually chair for a two-year period of the International SKA Steering Committee which was the, uh, the, the original body uh, formed by, uh, by radio astronomers that guided the early days of the SKA project. In fact, if I remember rightly, I was your vice chair. You took over, right. That's right. And then you, it, things really started to happen. Well, <laughs> that's, very, that's very kind of you. I think partly they started to happen because of the gentleman sitting in the, the third row there, Richard Scalizzi, who was the, uh, the director at that time. Anyway. Without further ado, I'd like to, uh, to, to let Jill uh, take over. You can see the title. We, we've, uh, we've asked her to imagine the world in 2050 and the, the SKA's role in this. And uh, I'm looking forward, as I'm sure the audience are, to an interesting talk. I believe we're, we are live streaming. The, uh, the information went out, I'm told, to 800,000 people. Um, <laughs> not sure if they're all going to be watching. But I think, uh, I do suspect you'll have a substantial audience out there, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Phil. Well, Phil, thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk. And as I was putting it together, I was thinking, why the hell did I agree to do this? What do I know about this topic? Um, and I have to say that sitting here in the room today with all of you who are working so hard on this project, I really began to understand what it means to be an alien. Um, I have been sadly disconnected with the SKA since the U.S. Um, bowed out of the, uh, the program. And so I've had an opportunity to come back and take a look at it from a, a different perspective. And um, in line with the alien comment, let me tell you that you will not hear anything about realities or work packages. <laughs> or anything concrete. Um, these were just some thoughts that I had when thinking about the world. Now, 35 years in the future, and the, my decision not to think about what we had learned from past experiences with large science projects over 30 years, because the reality is that you take that same 35 year period and you put it 35 years before now and the changes in the world over those 35 years will be trivial compared to the changes that we are going to experience in the next 35. And how do you imagine um, a scientific instrument that maintains its relevance and its purpose um, and the ability to do good for the world with that kind of rapid change and the 
planning structures that we currently use, which are glacial, maybe. That's a good word for them. We, we lock things in so far in advance. So any, here, here are some thoughts. I don't know whether they make any sense. They made sense to me when I put them down on the slides, and I'd really like to leave significant time for questions afterwards, and maybe we can explore some of these, these ideas that I'll at least raise. All right, so first of all, an old image, right, which I tried to paint sunny yellow. Um, and that's just, first of all, that's my involvement with the SKA, it's old. But it's also to try and say that what I've been thinking about has nothing to do with the current particular design uh, or um, the components. But this is the SKA as a world-class radio telescope that we all want to make happen. So in 2050, that telescope will be at the end of 30 years of operations post the first construction phase. Um, it'll be finishing up major surveys. It'll be interpreting fabulous scientific results. And probably most excitingly, it will be following up on surprises that we hadn't anticipated. Um, it will possibly be a globally important destination or tourism site. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and of course, it's going to be in need of a major upgrade, uh, whether that's phase three going to higher frequencies or something else, not clear at this point. And whatever we've done about computing, it's certainly going to need a major upgrade. Um, and that upgrade and the future uh, support and operations of the telescope are going to be in competition with other scientists who are desiring to build new instruments, right? Because mm -hmm. new is always better. Um, and maybe undergoing something that's akin to what we currently call a senior review um, process, so under pressures. And of course, it's going to be in search of ways to cut the annual operating costs because that is at least historically been the, um, the fate of instruments operating for decades. All right, so that's the SKA. What about the world? Well, in 2050, the world will be populated by somewhere between 2 and 2.6 billion more people. That's more mouths to feed, or if you're Peter Diamandis and believe in abundance, that's that many more minds that can help solve problems. All right, and as we've talked about a little bit today, uh, the population demographic will be shifting in the future. And this is an interesting um, result that I hadn't thought about. Every place else in the world is going to be losing its share of the population. But Africa is going to be gaining a huge fraction of the world's population by 2050. So, the world is going to be older and grayer. So the median age around the world is going to shift from 29 now to 36 in 2050. And what does that mean? This is, this is an interesting graph which shows um, for every working individual, the number of dependents defined as individuals less than 15 years of age or greater than 65 years of age. Now, that greater than 65, some of us who are in that category don't feel real dependent, but that's how we're, that's how we're classed. Um, and you can see the enormous rise in most of the world of the number of dependents for each working individual, except, again, in Africa and India. And how might this be relevant? Well, that basically means that every working individual is shouldering less of a burden of whatever social security and pension program is in place. Um, many of these countries um, to the right of the graph 
may face real problems of implosion because the working population is too small to support that entitled burden of the older uh, retired population. So it might just be that in, in Africa, um, and I don't have any figures for Australia or, um, or England on this chart, but, but it struck me that in Africa, because there isn't this crushing burden, there might be some flexibility in employment practices, um, some ability to do creative uh, ways of, of employing people that you can't get away with in the rest of the world. I don't know. That was just one of the things I was thinking about as I was trying to envision the world in 2050. So the world will also be hotter, right? Um, there is no getting away from that, and it doesn't really matter what model you use. Greenhouse gases are increasing and need to be decreased. And the amount of decrease and how quickly we can begin that remediation will, de will define what the global temperatures are in 2050. And, you know, if we act immediately and make the wisest choices to diminish greenhouse gases, we'll have the best outcome. But it could be really awful without that kind of um, mitigation. And that has profound effects on what we're going to be able to do um, with the resources that we're wanting to um, have operating in Africa and in Australia. I don't know whether it'll really affect Great Britain. Um, maybe the civil servants can take off their jackets. Uh, that's a facetious comment, I don't know, but it's really in the operational phase where this rise in temperature is going to be um, something that is uh, we have to deal with. And of course, it's going also to be drier. The number of days without rain um, increasing and, and, the, and the potential for drought in hugely increasing. Interestingly, um, at least according to um, Saul Werman and a number of futurists that he works with, um, our world at that time may be more organized around a network of, of megacities than it is around nations. So there's this interesting project that's going on. It's funded for five years called 192021. It's making a study of 19 megacities with populations in excess of 20 million in the 21st century. And Saul notes that um, Today we have 194 countries, um, but the world is no longer operating and thought of as a patchwork of countries. It's really today be beginning to become a network of cities. And the connectivity, um, real and virtual, among the cities are owned by a combination of private and public resources. And as we think about operating the square kilometer array on two continents with a headquarters in um, Great Britain, it might be that our operational modality is uh, defined, in fact, by this network of cities rather than by nation to nation uh, contracts and agreements. And all oh, the the interesting the the numerical fact is that today more than half of people live in urban cities, and by 2050 that number will be two thirds. Um, this is the uh, some of the uh, ideas that the five year study is going to consider. But thinking of looking at their website and thinking about these urban mega cities. I was struck by the concept of um, vertical farming. This, in fact, may be one of the ways that we feed um, an increasing population. And what does that have to do with the SKA? Well, 
farming is not just plants, but they're, they're looking at models where animals, herds are farmed vertically as well. And so both the Australian and the um, South African sites are um, herders. The, the agriculture in the area is um, livestock, primarily sheep. Uh, if this is the way things are going, and uh, what kind of balance is that going to do? Does that does that mean that the 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 population, as sparse as as it already is in these areas, becomes zero because there's no profit at all in farming animals and grazing animals on open land, or what does this mean? It's just a question. I don't have the answer, but it's one of the interesting factors that when you think about the world in 2050. All right. According to um, Peter Schwartz, uh, a, a futurist at salesforce.com, in 2050, the world is not going to be challenged primarily by warfare. But instead, the challenge is going to be sustainability water, food, energy, climate change, poverty. Those are the real challenges rather than large-scale warfare that he foresees. And the, the key of all of those, the thing that you, you would get the most leverage out of attacking in his mind is the global warming and climate change. It has so many intertwined consequences all across the globe. So, I also think that in 2050, the world's going to be filled with opportunities targeting those challenge areas. And today during the workshop, we heard some discussion about that. So what I think this, the SKA needs is a business model, not a business case. Let's build a business that goes far beyond science to make the SKA globally relevant to the world's population and makes it a leader in solutions to at least some of the challenges that we'll face in the world of 2050. So that's really a business model. And I'm really serious about business model. We may do things that a for-profit would do in order to run the SKA in the best possible way. So I have to put on my SETI hat. Phil knew I was going to do this when he invited me. But I have to say that one way that the SKA could become um, globally re relevant would be as the result of the science case that we call the cradle of life. And just in case you think I only talk crazy stuff like this when I'm flying overnight to give a talk to a group at, in, in Jodrell Bank, let me assure you that um, last September I addressed the President's Council of advisors on science and technology, along with two others about the future of science and technology. And I was willing to make these crazy statements there too, okay? So it's often said that the 20th century, it's the century of physics, the 21st century is going to be the century of biology. I actually think the case is that it's going to be the century of biology on Earth and beyond. I think that's going to be a hugely important piece of the 21st century. So since we began talking about the SKA, there have been a couple of really important game changers uh, having to do with the possibility of biology beyond the Earth. The first is the discovery and the appreciation of extremophiles. I think microbes are finally getting the respect they deserve. Right? So 
we now know that life not only exists but thrives in environmental conditions that are extraordinarily extreme. Boiling battery acid frozen in ice at the bottoms of the ocean where there's huge pressures and temperatures miles beneath the surface of the earth where there's no sunlight and life loves it. And it's taken millions of years of adaptation to spread it to all those niches. But the bottom line is that if there's any real estate out there, planets in orbit around other stars, there might be a lot more of it that's habitable than I would have thought when I was a student and was starting in this field. And of course, that's the second game changer exoplanets and moons, and not yet exomoons, but potentially exomoons. We just haven't found them yet. Um, we now know that other stars have planets. Planets are incredibly abundant. Every star probably has a planet, or two, or three. This is something that we did not know. Um, literally, when the SKA was first being discussed, we knew about the planets in our solar system. By 93, we knew about a couple of tiny little bodies around a pulsar, for heaven's sakes, a star that had exploded, and yet they're planets. Are they remnants? Did they reform? But that was their first look at anything that might be planet life around another star. And then in 95, the detection of the first planet around a main sequence a star. 51 pay. So huge changes in our expectation for whether or not there might be life beyond Earth. And in terms of life beyond Earth, there are three possibilities. You can discover it um, by looking, for example, on planets and moons within our own solar system, um, looking for biomarkers or you can discover it remotely by looking for biosignatures, doing a chemical assay of the atmospheres of these distant planets. You can detect it by finding technosignatures, or perhaps serendipitously as the result of doing some other astrophysical observational program on the universe that just tends up uh, showing you evidence of some large astroengineering projects. And lastly, you can export it, right? And <clears throat> we're talking about going to the moon or Mars or the asteroids. And if you're talking 2050, you're halfway through the century. And so you really should be talking about something like the 100-year Starship study program. We may be traveling ourselves or at least our avatars. <clears throat> so it's, it's the techno signatures where the SKA becomes a real um, strong player. So the SKA sensitivity, by the time you get to SKA2, um, improves the searches that we've been doing for the past five decades. Um, and it, it looks for weaker signals uh, or from more distant sources. And um, by 2050, it could have interrogated all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy multiple times for an expanded set of signal types. Now, he, that exploration doesn't say that it, it did the exploration with adequate sensitivity to, to actually detect those signals. Um, at the, the distances of the, the more distant stars, but it says that we will be searching stars or targets or places in the sky rapidly enough that by 2050, we've actually done a great deal. Now, this is a slide that I've borrowed from my colleague, Seth Shostak, and I usually give Seth grief about this slide, but I'm gonna use it because he's done something here, which is, I think, very informative. What Seth has done is to plot the, the date horizontally, and the number of star systems that have been observed 
vertically. And he's normalized it to um, a current, current rate. And he's just essentially used a Moore's law extension in terms of the number of stars that we will be able to probe um, every, every day throughout. And, and the ends that he has there is, he says, well, I'll use this chart in the following way. He says, tell me how many intelligent civilizations there are in the galaxy. Then I can tell you how many stars I'd have to search in order to have a probability of detecting a civilization. And then figure out where that is on the chart and I'll tell you how long it will take me to get there. So that's, it's just looking at the rate at which we're investigating new star systems. It doesn't say that, that each new star system that you investigate, you will have the sensitivity to detect a signal. And so what the SKA does, uh, this is for the ATA, right? And so it's not sensitivity related, so it's just rate related. So when SKA-1 comes on board and adds four beams to the three beams that we're simultaneously using with the SKA, the rate will increase. And then SKA-2, which I'm hoping um, will have another 10 beams, increases the rate that much farther. But, but the point is, by 2050, we will have multiply uh, investigated the 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and if we're looking for the right thing, and if their transmitters are strong enough, then indeed we have a significantly improved probability of success. And for me, the interpretation of this graph comes down to the fact that when you, when you write out the Drake equation, which is a wonderful way that Frank Drake first devised to organize our ignorance about whether life exists somewhere else, you have all these factors, the number of, the rate of star formation, um, the fraction of stars that have planets, the number of Earth-like planets in each system, and fractions like how many, uh, what fraction develop life, intelligence, technological civilizations, and how long does that technology persist? To within astronomical accuracy, to within factors of 10 or 100, okay? That equation really does uh, boil down to N is approximately equal to L, the longevity of the technological civilization in years. So what happens if we have a success? What does that tell us? Well, I know there are some people that expect that we're going to get the Encyclopedia Galactica. We're going to learn all these wonderful things about the cosmos that we hadn't yet been able to figure out on our own. But for me, I'd actually be content with just a dial tone, a ping, a proof of concept that another technological civilization is there. Because success cannot happen unless two technologies are close enough in space and lined up in the 10 billion year deep time of our galaxy so that they're close enough to detect one another. The only way that you're going to get that overlap in time is if L is very large. So if we ever succeed in detecting a signal with the SKA or any other instrument, but with the SKA, we learn that it is possible to become an old technological civilization. It's possible to get through the technological adolescence, the troubles and the challenges that we find ourselves facing today. It is possible that we, as a very young technology in this old galaxy, can in the future grow old as well. To me, that is the best motivation for continued work in science and technology. We know it's possible to get over these challenges. 
Well, so let's use that motivation to work and cooperate globally to solve the challenges that don't respect national boundaries. So I think if we have a success with the SKA, we know that N is equal to two, we drink the champagne, we declare success. We will then know that N is a very large number. Um, Martin Harwit wrote a book, oh, 1980s, that talked about this. Whenever you dif discover a new class A phenomenon, something that differs by anything else, um, in at least a factor of 10 to the three in an observable parameter, um, the, this, the moment you discover it a second time in a different way, um, you know there are many. And that's what it will be. The moment that we know that there's another technology out there, we know that there are many. And so I think that will fundamentally, I hope, um, skew the observing campaign that the instrument does, the SKA does. And I think there will be a lot of pressure to go find out about those other technologies. Um, and you notice at the bottom, I wrote and lower annual operating costs. So all of these fa factors that I'm going to, to mention have that in mind from now on. All right, so we have a success. And I think there will be um, a great desire on the part of humanity to have a reverence and um, affinity to the discovery site. And as opposed to what Phil said earlier today, um, I think that this influx of humans and devices um, shouldn't be forbidden. It just needs to be managed. It, ma it needs to be managed in a way to minimize their interference <coughs> impact from their devices. It needs to be managed in a way that brings in income that will help with the annual operating funds. So I think that this is a really large potential hospitality opportunity in the future. Um, and if, this is another point, if the SKA-2 were required for detection, its sensitivity was required, it's, it's unlikely that um, it will be replicated around the world. Um, there will be a great deal of interest in um, ga garnering any information that might be possible from um, a detected signal. But I don't think the rest of the world is going to build billion dollar projects to do it. I might be wrong and therefore, but my, my idea is that um, that will, it will change the, the nature of international cooperation. The SKA will become the vehicle by which this information, which <clears throat> I believe should be the property of all humanity, will be, it will be the conduit for that information. All right, so probability of success is difficult to estimate. If we never search, the chance of success is zero. That's the last sentence of the first scientific paper by Kokoni and Morrison in 1959. <coughs> it remains true today. And I think the thing that's important and what's game changing in the SKA2 in this field is that because we will be able to search by 2050 multiple times over all of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, um, null results <sighs> finally become significant. To date, our searches have been too small, too incomplete, but I think that by 2050, SKA2 will have done enough searching so that if the result is negative, that null could be significant. And I think the process of, chain, of, of searching, the process of the world getting involved with the SKA and looking for intelligent life elsewhere, fundamentally changes us. As astronomers, we forget this privilege that we have to stand back and see the universe 
large and to appreciate the long, deep times of cosmic evolution. So we stand back and see this and see ourselves in that context. It's, it's how we go about our days, but the public doesn't. Yet getting the public involved in this search as part of the SKA outreach actually makes them stand back. It holds up a mirror and it really does trivialize the differences among people among humans that we find so difficult to deal with today. So I think the process of searching fundamentally changes us. All right, now what about those challenges and those opportunities out there in 2020, 2050? All right, I think we need to stop thinking about the local farmers as only sources of RFI. I think they're potential <coughs> customers or at least partners. I think our business model ought to take that into account. How can we serve them? How can they serve us? Um, so for regional impact. Now, as I was thinking about this, I was very conscious of forest fires because last August in California, the flames of a forest fire came within yards of the antennas of the Allen Telescope Array and it was the local volunteer fire service that once again saved our antennas. And fires, fires, excuse me, forest fires, fires are a big concern um, in Africa and in Australia. And I didn't have the numbers for Australia, but here, um, here is this, uh, the um, fire service with 5,000 people employed over 200 bases this is South Africa, this is what I had the numbers for. And if you see the map and all of those nodes, that's where those bases are. And where will the SKA sites be? Well, it's basically mainly where those nodes aren't. Um, but the, um, the reason that there aren't organized firefighting uh, facilities in those regions is because the history of forest fires is, is very low, but it's, it's not zero. And so I think that just in my first thinking about partnering and remembering the forest fires of this past summer, I was thinking that the, the um, SKA and its staff should become um, partners with the local uh, farmers in terms of taking care of these problems and, and a lot of other common problems. Um, I think that right now, I already said that, that climate change and doing something about greenhouse gases is the longest lever arm that we can push on and very important. And so um, I'm, I'm struck, I've gotten, I've had the opportunity to meet a number of really, really clever people seem clever to me anyway, um, who are working on this question. And um, I'm going to bring some solutions to you that might not be in the thinking of um, the SKA planning, but when you're talking about 2050, it's a lot that can happen between then and now. One thing to start with and to start with right now is something called biochar. Well, it's essentially using molten salt to in 10 minutes do what a thousand years of natural um, charcoal production does. And the largest facility right now is um, at uh, Tsinghao University. Uh, it's overseen by Frank Xu, an astronomer who has gotten very interested in climate change um, and is very close to the government, Taiwan. Um, and so the point is that this reactor can, in a very carbon neutral way, take um, biomass, very low quality biomass, and produce a charcoal that can be burned in a much cleaner way with no, um, no greenhouse gases for, for energy uses. And 
you can see that the, the stations here in South Africa are in poor quality. They're not in rich, dense rainforests, right? There isn't a lot of biomass easily had. But, but this biochar process uses really low quality biomass to produce high efficiency charcoal as an energy source. And so here's, here's a factory that would do, oh, I have to soup, okay, super torrify, right? That's the word, um, uh, biomass, and have all of these uh, other spin-off products that could be sold and used for energy. And it's carbon neutral, that's the whole, um, idea and you can see that uh, in fact the kinds of savanna and grasslands that Africa and to an extent the um, Western Australia offer are good biofuel so I think that we ought to be looking at investing in this process which is not yet commercially viable but I think that that should be part of the strategy um, and thinking about how we can help with the challenges of the tw 2050 coming up. I think we need to invest in this kind of thing and then make use of those fuels. We've talked about green, we've talked about renewable. I'm thinking this is a, a way we ought to start right now. And then in terms of general energy production, here here's a when the site bids were made, the proposers were asked to look at the costs and the feasibility of alternate energy sources. Well, Australia didn't mention nuclear. It's not in the Australian DNA. But it is, was mentioned as a possibility for um, South Africa. But that was thinking about the current generation of nuclear reactors. And in fact, I think what we want to be looking at is two new fourth generation reactors, um, traveling wave reactors and modular thorium reactors. All right? South Africa does have two reactors at Coburg, and it has the concomitant problem of what to do about fissile waste, spent fuel, right? And so I think it was last year, the NWSDI, Nuclear Waste Something Disposable um, Initiative, was, was started. What are you going to do with your fissile waste? Well, one really good thing is to burn it in one of these TWR reactors. They're in ground, they're sealed, they start with that as fuel, they burn for 30 years, they're done. Um, as you can see, energy engineered for safety, energy costs, um, what are proliferation, proliferation resistant, um, reliable sources of energy to all, um, all nations. I think that this is something that you ought to be thinking about when you're thinking about 2050 and how you're going to operate um, an SKA in remote sites. The world is a little bit, a lot, goosey about nuclear power right now. Um, these folks at TerraPower claim they're going to have working systems in 20 years. The licensing and regulation may take longer than that. Um, but given the public's uh, uneasiness with nuclear, they may really want remote sites, right, to emplace the first of the commercial reactors of this type, but remote sites that happen to have already invested in transmission lines so that enough excess power can be generated to sell back to the energy companies for distribution elsewhere or into the neighborhood. Um, I think we ought to be thinking about generating extra power as a way of uh, lowering the annual operating costs. And I know that goes, Phil told me that goes across against some tenant of SKA thinking, but maybe we should rethink that. And if not um, TRWs, then modular thorium reactors. These things, all right, 
something on the desktop can give a megawatt and they scale so you can have family sized farm sized ska sized um, and again all of the benefits of safety non-proliferation and uh, green energy these two technologies are are at the point where investment would be a good future strategy and I don't know how to make that business plan but I think it should be looked at all right poverty well here's an idea we had a great great talk from um, <laughs> sorry I'm tired Bernie Fanaroff sorry for Bernie about all of the innovative things um, they've done in South Africa we heard from the Australians some of their experiences with spin-offs and local companies and that kind of thing. I think you ought to be thinking about fab labs. What are fab labs? Well, they're a way of addressing right now this new disruptive manufacturing paradigm called additive manufacturing, right? And I think we ought to start. These things cost $100,000 uh, and they have to do with machines that make and machines that make machines that make and very smart materials and they are discrete the met they're they're manufactured locally they are self-correcting in terms of their errors the materials can be very dissimilar and in particular they are reversible you take these things apart you deconstruct them just as you constructed them and you reuse them. And um, so fab labs are a way of getting local communities involved right now at a very low cost. So that image at the top is um, a, a village of reindeer herders, right? In very isolated ar Arctic region and if you look at the map down below of where there are fab labs, you see that, in fact, South Africa is already there. Oh, I, oh okay, shouldn't change slides in the middle of a meeting. Uh, I went to the website, and in fact, there are seven already fab lab sites in South Africa, and they have a mobile fab lab, and there are fab labs in Australia, and I think there should be an SKA fab lab or two or three. It's a hundred K investment and it trains a whole new population in a new manufacturing paradigm. So they don't have to go and learn old fashioned manufacturing skills. They can learn the new skills that are going to disrupt the old. So the question to ask yourself is what would a Merino sheep farmer want to manufacture? Um, for himself or his neighbors or for the SKA one even. And then I think you can bootstrap into a culture and capability that uses um, additive manufacturing um, for a much more sustainable SKA two. Let's build the thought of additive manufacturing, this really green uh, way of making things smartly into the SKA plans too. And SKA2, I think you should be looking for customers and space situational awareness is one very obvious opportunity. Um, arrays have an enormous advantage in this field. Um, you might want to rethink hmm, design of the SKA2 in order to allow for more rapid steering if you want to um, be dealing with, with LEOs, following LEOs, or if you're gonna be using um, Passive radar, which we've demonstrated works extremely well with an array. Um, you might just say, okay, MEO and higher is all right. Um, there's also a question here of doing something that might be the right thing to do for the world, the right thing to avoid the tragedy of commons, of collisions in space in that common resource that we all use. Um, there might be a need for an NGO um, that can gain access to precision catalogs of positions and will use open source code 
for this orbital deconfliction so that it can be checked by the world and can instill a sense of trust. Maybe this is a business model, something that the SKA would like to make happen. Um, so I think in closing that the world of 2050 affords the SKA with just ample opportunity to become an integral part of sustaining life as we know it on this planet and detecting it elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. So I, I understand you're willing to take a few questions? Yes. Yeah. So, any questions for Joe? Yes, Mark. <clears throat> So, Jill, first of all, a very nice talk, um, really, really fantastic. Um, as you know, I'm a, a SETI proponent, and I believe that every radio telescope on the planet, including the SK in the future, should be doing SETI. Um, but sometimes I become a little bit depressed because you mentioned two very important things. You mentioned um, extremophiles, and you mentioned longevity. Um, the need for longevity, probably, if you're going to detect a, a signal or communicate or whatever. Um, and yet, when you look at the other planets in the solar system, if you look at the Moon, if you look at Mars, Venus, all the comets that we've visited, um, they have extreme conditions, but so far there's absolutely no evidence that there's any life, at least on the surface of those, of those bodies. And the second thing to do with longevity is that if you look again at these places in the solar system, there's absolutely no evidence that we've been visited by another um, civilization that's able to travel across the, the galaxy, which you might expect if civilizations do have a long persistence. Do you ever feel a little bit depressed in the way that I do? Well, actually, I have the advantage of working at the SETI Institute with um, daily interaction with my astrobiology colleagues who are rabid about missions to Europa or to Titan where in fact they don't expect to find life on the surface but in liquid beneath the surface or in Titan in the lakes on the surface. So my colleagues would not agree with you that we've not found evidence of life on the surface of any problems. We just, we really not done that experiment, Mike. And, and the same is true for the we haven't been visited. You know, the solar system, even the solar system is big. Um, so I can't say that they're not here. I mean, I, I they're not abducting Aunt Alice off the streets, right, for salacious medical experiments. I, that's, that's bogus. But we've so poorly explored our own environment. Yeah, um, we've looked at the Lagrange points, big, bright, Battlestar Galactica things. Probably could have found those. Small, dark things, no. Um, so, again, it's a question of, I don't think that we've searched well enough to make any significant claims about null results. Mike, not So your, uh, the argument about the longevity assumes that a technological civilization is synonymous with being a radio loud civilization. Isn't it possible and likely that it, being radio loud is actually a very passing phase. And that maybe even, you know, maybe by 2050 or in 100 years, the Earth won't be radiating much in the way of straight radiation because we'll have much more efficient uh, ways of communicating where we do use broadcasts, they're going to be tightly beamed, very, very efficiently focused. And so, uh, you know, all we'll be using fibers or, or other technologies. And so, uh, this, you know, just Sending a lot of radio signals out into space is only a, perhaps a very passing phase for a technological civilization. Okay, what you described is a is an example of leakage radiation, right? 
um, intended for our own purposes. Even there, I wouldn't agree with you that we will necessarily go radio quiet. The, um, the beamed uh, orbital resources still have back lobes. They're smaller, right, than the main lobe, but they are still there. Uh, you can't lay fiber between planets. And if we become a multiple body system in the solar system, um, optical comms may or may not be possible. Radio comms would be. Uh, again, to, to, to end up, if that's the analog on their end, we'd end up having to be in the beam to detect it. So I actually don't worry very much about that because to tell you the truth, the easiest thing for us to find is going to be something that was intended and deliberately transmitted. Somebody's put some gain behind that signal because they expected it to be found by an emerging technology. Um, in that model, um, what we do for our own purposes isn't very relevant. So, um, yes, we probably are not going to leak at the same level that we do now, or maybe we'll leak more. Maybe somehow we decide, that, although it seems really inefficient, that um, B612, that, that spacecraft for detecting incoming asteroids, um, isn't the best way to go. Maybe even though it is an art of fourth problem, a radio halo, a, a radar halo, might be the best defense against incoming asteroids from all directions, including sunward. Um, that would be a type of leakage that's much more powerful than anything we're doing now. Again, uh, right now, I'd bet on B612. Uh, I can't remember what their spacecraft is called, but it's a, a, a spacecraft that will orbit um, interior between the Earth and Venus and look out and nominally detect all the um, near-Earth asteroids and comets that might be a problem for us. Could I just ask a question or go to you? I was intrigued by, by that, uh, the modified thorium reactor you showed, um, that one megavolt. I presume that uh, was in, in the laboratory. Do you know if any of these have been manufactured and no. being used? No. no, which is the reason you want to invest now, right? <laughs> the right thing for the world Maybe not the SKA, but it's the right thing for the world to do, and the SKA could have a vested interest in doing it, mm -hmm. is to bring these new technologies um, to reality. And, you know, it, it's one thing to get them working. The regulation process is even longer yeah. to get them licensed, which is why 2050 is a good horizon to be looking at for mm -hmm. using them. Okay. To, to, to speculate a little bit more about the uh, subject we didn't hear much about today. We saw Galileo with his telescope. And today we discussed all day about scientists that are struggling with the impact of science and the impact and their relations with industry. How do you see the role of the scientists in 2015? Have you, have you given that any thought? Well, I actually, that was what I heard from uh, the rest of you all day. I, I actually decided I was going to be the contrarian and, and take these the other points. The SKA, assuming it gets its 30 years of operational to, to 2050, is not going to go on unless it's relevant in a way that none of the astronomy projects that we're talking about have really been relevant to society prior to this. It's got to get involved in these grand challenges. Any more questions? Yes, Adrian. So it's interesting you just said something about um, there might be a deliberate signal from an advanced civilization that like to contact a, a less advanced civilization. Um, I, for one, feel very uneasy about the fact that there are um, uh, activities where we're deliberately trying to signal other civilizations, especially since we are not that advanced and they don't be more advanced than us. Um, my mother told me not to invite people I don't know to, to home. Um, why are we doing this? <laughs> Actually, it's a great question, this whole question about, um, well, I mean, we're expecting them to transmit. Maybe we should be transmitting. And 
timely for you to ask that because uh, in February, the AAAS, American Association of Advancement of Science, at their annual meeting, we have a session discussing exactly this point about um, what's the reality. In the first place, as you've just said, that horse is already out of the barn. We've been leaking since the early television signals, and if they're really much more advanced, so much more advanced they could get here to do us harm, they've heard that, assuming they're within 70 or 80 light years. Um, so that's the reality. Um, what's the perception? Something different? What are the um, legal aspects of things, policy aspects? We're going to have this session and discuss this. And what I'm hoping is that this is a kickoff for a two-year process of having a global conversation about this question. Now, over 50 years, we've had a um, handful of meetings on SETI and society and uh, cultural aspects of SETI, et cetera. Um, the people in those meetings looked much more white and first world than um, Bernie was complaining that the, the, the SKA South Africa was getting a hard time about. They only include a very small, they have a percentage of the world's traditions and religions um, and people. But what I'm hoping is that because of social media, because this mobile technology is the first adopted technology in um, developing nations around the world, we actually can have a conversation that will involve all of these people that have not had a say in whether or not we do this. Well, thank you very much, Joe. I think we'll call it uh the proceedings to a halt and uh, very much appreciate you coming over to give that talk. Thank you. Thanks.